I'm honored to be with you. You may be seated. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about Holy Vision. I know uh, a lot of us in the room are, are big fans of the Elevation Maverick City song that came out early this year, Jaira. You guys know the song, Jaira? Jaira, you are enough. You want me to sing it? No, no, no. no. Uh, so it's interesting. In Genesis, um, in honor of God's provision, Abraham renamed the mountaintop when God provided the alternative sacrifice for Isaac, when God provided the ram there. He called the mountain Jehovah Jireh. And that was 4,000 years ago. And I always think about, you know, the golden dome on top of the Temple Mount. That's where that mountain was. That was where it was represented. So when I see that golden dome, I often think about that moment where God provided that that alternate uh, sacrifice. Um, And for years, I understood that Jireh simply means provision. And so Jehovah Jireh means God is our provider, which is true. But I recently came to understand that the root word of Jireh actually means to see. And the concept is about prevision or a provision, a foreknowledge. There's a link to what is provided from what was seen. So Jehovah Jireh really means God sees, and so God will see to it. So actually two concepts there. And I know, In particular, right now, a lot of that's happened the last couple years, a lot of us have dealt with um, mental health issues and struggles. And I know with COVID, is that true of a lot of folks in the house, I'm sure? Um, Well, I get it. Um, Back in August, I had for the first time in my life what I would call an extreme panic attack. Um, It was dark, it was debilitating, it was demonic. And I was stranded in my car for several hours, not able to drive and ended up having to cancel phone calls and meetings for the next couple of days. And I felt like I received a glimpse of what people that are facing suicidal thoughts really go through. It gave me a new insight. Now here's an anxiety fighter key that I've used my whole life. This is Romans 12, two. It says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit by a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. The primary way you transform the way you think is through the lens of God's word and his spirit, not through the lens of our experience or our trauma. So what Alex said earlier about precedent, what Natalie said earlier about promises, that's where you overcome these things. So my fight with depression as a young man really began in in, in my childhood home. I was raised by a second-generation alcoholic. My grandfather died in the streets when my dad was 13 of his alcoholism. And then alcoholism also took my, my father out as well. He lost his last job when I was 16, and really never provided for our family again and just basically lived in in isolation alone in the house that I grew up in. And um, it's interesting because of that history and God's grace on my life, I can say I've been married to Miss Carol Maxwell for 33 years because, (laughs) because I got sober 34 years ago myself. Um, So it's interesting, in in recent weeks, I came to understand that panic attack in August. I came to see that it's really rooted in provision issues. One, my dad's failure to provide for our family. And then two, fear that I, or God with me, might fail at providing for my family now. Repeating my dad's pattern, which is a lie. So back during the conference a few weeks back on Saturday when uh, Pastor Henry and Alex anointed us all and prayed for us, I was stepping forward in faith, just believing whatever that was that happened in August, that there was going to be a breakthrough. And she prayed over us, spoke some some tremendous words of life, and we walked away. And it was great. And it was a sweet, sweet day for those of you who were here. And a week later, I'm down in downtown Nashville, 
And I called Carol to come down and meet me uh, to have kind of a dinner out just to, to start the weekend special. So she met me at this restaurant called Bourbon Steak, which is on top of the JW Marriott. If any of you have been there, it's an amazing restaurant with probably the best view of downtown. It has glass uh, walls all the way around. Some of them go all the way down to the floor. It's a beautiful view. So we have a great dinner, uh, kind of an early dinner. We finish up. And then we walk over to the, the bar area just to really take in the view of downtown. And, and we see three young ladies who are obviously out-of-towners visiting, celebrating something special. So we take a picture of them, you know, for them on their camera, on their phone, and, and then they take a picture of us. And then we move on around the bar and just take in the view and, and, and enjoy our time there. It was a great night out. And then um, about a half hour later, we are actually taking off and we go to the elevator and we end up the elevator at the same time as these three young ladies. And we chat a bit more. We get their first names. We find out just they're from Texas and some, some similarities with, with me. That's where I grew up. And we talk a bit, a bit and that's it. And then we kind of go down to the street and, and enjoy the rest of our evening. Well, the next morning, I see a message I have on Facebook from my cousin in Texas, who I've not seen in over 40 years. And um, I've not seen her, we've not really corresponded. And she messages me, she goes, I think you met my daughter in a restaurant in Nashville last night. I'm like, what? And so she sends me a picture, and sure enough, one of those three young ladies that I didn't even know was related to me, turns out was my cousin's daughter. And uh, so I said, well, listen, tell her to reach out. I'd love to just say hello to her now that I know that we're related. <laughs> Please, you know, it'd be great to have a few minutes with her. So it worked out the next day. She comes over. We spend about an hour together. We have coffee. And here's this young lady who 24 hours before, I didn't even know existed. I didn't even know my cousin had a daughter. And this cousin is the only living relative of my children and my sister's children connected back to my father. And so all of a sudden I'm looking at this young lady, this, she's a strong believer, she's telling us her whole story. And I'm just going, oh my goodness, here I'm, I'm looking at someone who I share this six to 7% of the same DNA with I've never even known existed until right now. And it was crazy because I'm, I'm trying to figure out how could this have possibly happened? You know, um, in order, her name was Marcia. For, in order for us to meet, we had to go to an early dinner which we don't usually do. We had to skip dessert. We had to walk to this bar area and this restaurant at the same time. We, we had to walk to the elevator 30 minutes later at the same time. We meet them. And then we both had to happen to post on social media that we were at this restaurant that night for my cousin to even see it and put it all together. Right? So coincidence? No, no. So <laughs> God was obviously up to something supernatural and I didn't know what it all meant. So for weeks afterwards, we were just like going, what in the world? Why would you reconnect me for the first time with this person that's connected to my father and my family in that way? And the, basically a new discovery of life. And um, we couldn't figure it out. We were just stunned and couldn't get it. So then one Sunday night, we're watching the Chosen series. Anybody fans of the Chosen series? Okay, season two, episode two, is the story of Nathaniel becoming a disciple. Powerful episode. So we don't really know Nathaniel's story, although we do know that God saw him underneath a fig tree praying and, and seeking after God. Well, the episode portrays that Nathaniel had a, a deep loss in a morning and he was really struggling with something and that's why he was under that tree crying out to God. Well, then the moment comes when Jesus actually meets Nathaniel for the first time. And let me just read you this, this passage. This is from John 1, 47. It says, as they approached, Jesus said, now here's a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity how do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. And Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. And then Nathaniel fell to his knees and exclaims, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And Jesus asked him, do you believe this? Just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. So the king of Israel says, I saw you. So Carol and I, we now believe that this fresh, unlikely encounter 
with a puzzle piece of my childhood, a brush with my dad's DNA, was God reaching from heaven, which heaven's not thousands of miles away. Heaven's really very near. But it's God reaching from heaven and saying to me a couple of things. He's reminding me of the goodness in my dad because he was created in God's image. And most importantly, he was saying to me, I saw you, Mark. Back in the middle of that loss and trauma during your childhood, I saw you alone and overcome with anxiety that day back in August. I see you today as I am renewing you inwardly each day, and I will walk with you through it. You are not alone. And he says to you today, I saw you. I see you. And I will walk with you through it. You are not alone. Not, o- not only does he promise to see to it and see it through, God sees you and he will see you through. Come on, come on. That was beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. As if this wasn't already terrifying enough, now I really got to bring it for you guys, huh? You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Man, it is just an incredible honor to be here. Like uh, Pastor Alex said, I work with the college students, so if you happen to see anybody walking around with a tan lanyard, give them a high five. They are incredible people. I'm honored to be able to work with each and every one of you, those of you that are here. Uh, Pastors Alex and Henry, thank you for the opportunity to share here. I wanted to give you guys just a little bit of my background. She says I've got a number of degrees, so I served as a worship and experience pastor for about 20 years, and I was an adjunct professor in the midst of that. I have a bachelor's in music, a master's in theological studies, and I'm currently working on my PhD in worship. Um, I collect Legos and vintage video games. Here's the the big one. In 1999, I convinced my uh, then high school sweetheart, now wife, who's over there, to dress up as Padme Amidala while I dressed up as young Obi-Wan Kenobi, and we waited for 12 hours in George Lucas's hometown of Modesto, California, to see Star Wars Episode One. And we made it into the official Star Wars magazine. I'm pretty proud of that achievement. So... Why do I say all of this? I just have to lay out the nerd credential. Like, I'm an adjunct dean director, right? So full-on nerd, we are going to learn some incredible stuff. I want to call this little message, if you're taking notes, the harmony of the Trinity. And so we are going to talk about a way that God has given us an understanding of the Trinity. I've spent a lot of time thinking about things like propitiation and pneumatology and soteriology and all of the ologies. But one of the things that I really find myself getting stuck on is the Trinity, God in three persons, blessed trinity, right? So three distinct persons and yet one God. And then we as finite beings try to wrap our head around that and we get stuck. But I think God has given us a way to understand this in an incredible way. And so I'll just invite you into my classroom for a couple minutes as we learn together. You guys with me? We're going to have participation and yeah. I would ask you to uh, refrain from sticking your gum under your seat and uh, keep your questions till the end. You guys ready? Let's read this passage from Philippians 4, 8. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, when I was reading that and looking into the history of Philippians, there's so much to unpack in there. Side note too, I'm kind of like Doug in uh, Up, the dog that's always like squirrel, right? So apologize for that in advance. But Paul is saying... Here, he's telling us how to really meditate on stuff, and I also think it's really cool, which is a whole other thing to talk about, is that this comes from a letter that Paul wrote while he was in prison. And Paul, I would like to think, is a nerd as well, so we're in good company. He says in Philippians 3 that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, that he was like the most pharisaical Pharisee, which God changed him dramatically. But what it meant is that he knew the Old Testament really, really, really well. And in Galatians 3, he says that when Jesus came and radically changed his life, when the Holy Spirit came into his heart, he went off for three years 
and studied before he came back and started to do ministry. And so what that tells me is when we're reading Philippians 4.8, when he's saying, look for whatever is true and noble and right, he really spent time seeking it. And I think God can reveal himself to us in all kinds of big and small ways. And as much as we read our Bible, it's incredible to me that we learn something new almost every time we go into it through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who just illuminates what we see in Scripture. We should study and love the Word of God, and we want to let God do what He does in it. So when He's telling us to find whatever's true and noble and to think on those things, what's so cool is that He was actually in prison, so there was definitely nothing around Him that was that noble and pure to look at other than the glory of God. Check out this passage in Romans 1.20. This is Paul who wrote this as well. He says, from the beginning, creation in its magnificence enlightens us to his nature. Creation itself makes his undying power and divine identity clear, even though they are invisible. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Paul understood that God is absolutely showing himself in everything in nature. The fact that we exist is a testimony to God. And so when he tells us, finally, Whatever's true, noble, right, pure, everything that's excellent or praiseworthy, he says, think about these things. So here we go. Ready for a nerd moment? Think about such things. That word in the Greek is logizomai. Turn to your neighbor, say logizomai. That's great. If you're online, you say logizomai as well. <clears throat> this is more than just thinking. It means to reckon, consider, or ponder. It's deep reasoning and pondering and thinking over a long period of time. This isn't just picking what you're going to have for dinner. It's not, I think I want to do Chick-fil-A or Taco Bell. This is deep, deep understanding. And so he's telling us to find those pure things and don't just like pass off them. Don't just bounce off them, but deeply, deeply meditate and think on them. So that's what we are going to do. We're going to spend the next couple minutes just logizomaying. Is that okay with you guys? So like I said, we're talking about the Trinity, and I want to show you the harmony of the Trinity. It, it's difficult for us to understand how to actually describe the Trinity. And one of the ways we tend to do it is to think of maybe like water, right? So God in three persons, but one thing. Water can be ice and it can be steam and it can be uh, liquided, but it's never really quite the one of like all three of those at the same time. So it's kind of a way for our finite minds to understand water, or excuse me, understand the Trinity through water, but it doesn't quite get there. And I think at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to completely wrap our heads around the Trinity, but I think it would make sense that God actually uses music, the thing that he created us to be able to give back to him. He uses music to show himself through it. Clemens, the theologian Clemens of Alexandria, says that man is himself a musical instrument for the glory of God. And we did it today. Some of us were on instruments, most of us weren't. And we made incredible music together. So I need you guys to participate. Like I said, we're going to do something here. So, whether you can sing or not, can we all just sing this note, whatever syllable you want, la or do, or however trained you are. Are you ready? Can we sing this? Beautiful. You guys sound beautiful. Right, let's do the next one. Wonderful. Awesome. Now, can, we'll see if we can just use this. Can everyone just pick one note, and we'll do it together. So, we're looking for all three of these notes. Ready? Let's go together. There you go. Keep it up. Keep it up. Come on. You can just take a breath. Come back in. It's okay. If you do, just take, that sounds amazing. That sounds absolutely amazing. You guys, I mean, it just feels like worship, right? right? Without even seeing a lyric, we, we are giving a testimony to God. We're giving worship to God. So bear, bear with me here again. We're going to talk about sight and sound, and I promise this is going to be incredible. It's incredible to me. I hope it's an amazing blessing to you. So if I'm holding my Bible here, we're going to talk just purely about perception, getting metaphysical. Like you see my Bible. It could be whatever. You could see this water bottle. The cool thing about sight and sound is they're a little bit different. So when you see this water bottle, you only see it here, right? You see it where... I said it. Your vision is full of the water bottle right there. There's no water bottle here. There's no water bottle here. You, can't, you with me, right? Cool. When you hear, when you perceive, there's no part of your hearing that this note is not occupying. You guys get that? Did we go too far? So the, the, the water, water bottle's there, not here, right? 
so vision, but, but hearing is different. Hearing, we can't break hearing off into a small part where I'm only hearing in one spot, right? So, boom, you guys get where I'm going with this? So if we do the next note, a triad in music, three distinct, fully complete notes, right? And yet they're all coming together to make one chord called a triad, which just means three. You, you see the trinity in that? Can we, can we sing this again together? You guys ready? You just pick one. Here we go. Come on, louder than that. Let's actually use this for worship. Yeah. Wonderful. And then check out what Jesus says in Matthew 18, 20. It says, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. God has baked a testimony to himself just purely through our gathering. No matter what the lyric is, just purely in music, we're the only creation that God's made that has the capacity to create music like that, to come together without an instrument or anything. We can make harmony. And just the existence of that harmony, I think, is one of the most understandable ways to try to understand the Trinity. Three complete persons, one God coming together in unity. Pastor Henry last week told us how important it was to get plugged in. We can't harmonize if we're on our own. We have to come together. So there we go. <laughs> so next time you harmonize, next time you hear music, think about God. Think about a father who loves you, a son who died for you, and a Holy Spirit who lives within you, all coming together just purely through the harmony of the music that he's given us. Thanks. Absolutely stunning. 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 <laughs> You guys can have a seat. Good morning. Alex got me boohoo crying and I didn't even walk out here yet. Give me just a second. Um, Alex, I remember that day meeting you at Chipotle. That was the first Sunday that we were in this building and you guys had had a crazy morning. Uh, our first Sunday, it was August 30th. Our daughter's birthday was the next day and we, this is off topic, I'll hurry. Um, we had joined the church back at Rocket Town. We had been there for three months, and on our second night of DNA, the Nashville tornado came through, and then COVID happened. So everything shut down, and we were like, no, we're still falling in love with our church. And so we were on live stream for five months, and I just was praying. I was like, Lord, I just really wanna meet Alex and Henry. We love them, we adore them. They're such good leaders of our house. We just wanna meet them. And we came to service the first Sunday here, stayed around talking forever. We walked into Chipotle, and there they were, and I was like, there's my girl. Uh, and it was really, really a special moment. So we love you. I'm honored to be here. I am married to the dashingly handsome Jonathan Darcy. We have three gorgeous kids. They're delicious. You'll see them running around. Zara is six. Stella turns four tomorrow. And Kingston is 19 months. And uh, we lead a co-group in Spring Hill. And we are honored, so honored, to be a part of this house for the last year and a half. It has forever changed our family, and I'm honored to be here this morning. Um, you've heard the song, you ain't no hollerback girl, I'm a hollerback girl. So holler back at me if you're with me. I'm the last of six speakers this morning. I need your energy. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna be reading today from Mark chapter five, starting in verse 25. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Instantly her flow of blood ceased and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's just a couple verses, but amen, she was healed immediately. But her affliction was not just a moment. This woman had been bleeding for 12 years. We don't know a lot about her in the text, but we know that back then because of customs and because of her bleeding, she would have been isolated. She would have been cast out. We don't know if she was married. We don't know if she ever had the chance to bear children before this happened, but we do know what the culture said about her condition. And I can only imagine what she was experiencing. 
I want to tell you a brief story that I've never shared in a public forum. And you know, when the enemy tries to make you feel shameful or doubt that you're supposed to share it, you should probably share it. There's probably some power in there and somebody who needs to hear it. So let me just briefly tell you, when I was 17 years old, I began to experience some weird things in my body. And through a series of tests, I found out I had a very rare disease. The doctors didn't know how or when I uh, contracted this disease, which is supposed to make you feel better, but it doesn't. And so my parents got me into this amazing study. I got to work with the best of the best infectious disease doctors. And I was taking this new medication that was supposed to heal me. But because it was brand new, I had several doctor's appointments. And so six months into the treatment, I went to uh, the eye doctor for routine eye exam. And there was a lot of chatter, a lot of whispering, a lot of chatter in the hallway. And about about 30 minutes later, they came in the room. And as a 17-year-old, I sat there and the doctor said to me, You need to stop taking the medication immediately. It's having a reverse effect on your body. Your eyes are bleeding out and you are going blind. Excuse me? I came to get contacts. I was 17 years old. I don't remember the drive after that. I just know I went to the church because I knew it would be to God's house. And the pastor came in the room with my dad and they anointed my head with oil and they prayed over me. And I heard Jesus say, who do you say that I am? You're my healer. Then you believe in that. Okay? Two days after that was a Sunday morning. My mom and I are at the altar. I am so confused. God, I want to believe you. I want to believe you. You're my healer. But what is happening? And this man came, this spirit-filled man who prayed. He knew the authority that was given to him through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. And he declared over me, your vision is healed in the name of Jesus. So you won't be surprised to find out when I went back to the doctor a couple days later, they were a little ticked off. They did the scans once, twice, three times. Now the room is full of ophthalmologists because they all went in on this action. And they're frustrated. Mallory, there's no bleeding on your scans. There's none. Your eyes are fine. We don't know what we saw, but it's gone. You know what? I was really confused why I had the rare disease. And when the threat for blindness came, I wanted to look at my circumstances and say, God, but the dreams you've given me, how will I do that? How will I ever marry? How will I ever have kids? How will I fulfill what I believe you've called for my life? And he said, just watch me show up. I wonder how many in this room can kind of, come, can kind of understand that. We're looking at this woman with her affliction. It was very costly. Not only does it say that she had spent everything, so it was costly monetarily, but it had caused her relationships. She then had to live in isolation. It probably cost her the dreams that she had had for her life. I wonder how many of us in this room are in need of a miracle. It may be financial. It may be mental. It may be physical. It may be emotional, and it may be spiritual. But I do think that right now, today, there are some of us resting in the gap between what we expected to happen and what we're experiencing. And if you don't surrender that to Jesus, that gap can be the source of a lot of bitterness and a lot of anger. And guess what? Then that becomes the idol and not the miracle you've been praying for. You hear me? I only speak to you this morning because I'm still there. I've got a big miracle I'm praying for, but I serve a big God and I know he's going to come through, but I'm in the gap, y'all. I'm in the gap where I get to choose to see past the present circumstances and believe in what the word of God says. Believe because I've experienced his miraculous through medicine and miraculously I've been healed. I didn't tell you this. I only had six months of that treatment. It was supposed to be a year. I was healed of that disease in the name of Jesus. I'm still healed. Now, somebody doubting their faith could say, well, why did I have to go through that at all? Why, Jesus? That's not my portion. Sickness isn't my portion. And what about my eyes? That was so random. Like, what even happened? But you know what? I think he just wanted to know that he had my heart no matter what. You know? When we're praying for a supernatural touch from him, it's not on our own time. And it's not in our own way. It's not by our own works but he invites us to participate in the healing. He invites us to participate in the provision. He invites us to participate into this process where he is literally reaching down and saying, I'm your father and I have you. 
this woman, I want to keep reading, starting in verse 30. It says, at once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. Jesus says, who touched me? The disciples are laughing. They're like, yo, there's a lot of people out here. Are you serious? I have a four-year-old. She's four tomorrow. She's a four-nager. Her name is Stella, and she's very accident-prone, and she falls a lot. But when she falls, the first thing I say is her name, Stella. Baby, look at mommy. Get up. It's okay. It's okay. And I believe that's what Jesus wanted to do here. He stops. He's on a mission. He's working through the crowd. He stops and he calls her by name, daughter. Your faith has healed you. He wanted to call her by name and he wanted her to know the source. How many of you know when a miracle happens in your life, we try to explain it? What? You ask for a miracle and now you want an explanation? We don't operate in those terms. God doesn't operate in worldly terms. He operates in the supernatural. And if he said he was going to do it, he's going to do it. And you better take the blessing and move on. But he wanted her to know your faith has healed you. Because the minute she stood up, the naysayers would try to explain it. The people that had cast her out, the people that had doubted, the people that had been so ugly to her, that had just written her off, would try to explain the situation. No, she knew the source. I wonder how many of us in this room today that are expecting a miracle know that it doesn't come cheaply. This woman had to push, physically push through the crowd of people, right? The whole time she's hearing them, get out of here, there's no place for you, no one and nothing's gonna save you. But also in her mind, she has already accepted the label of herself, over herself, unwanted, not worthy, destined for failure, destined for punishment. The Lord never spoke that over her. Her circumstances did. I wonder what her quiet time was like in those 12 years. I'm sure there are some moments where she, <laughs> she was on fire for God. She was like, I believe you're my healer. And I'm sure there were some moments where honestly, she was desolate, she was destitute, and she probably had a lot of doubt. If you're in this room and you've been alive for just a couple hours, you've probably experienced both of those. But the Holy Spirit woos us. We don't have to push through a crowd of people because of the sacrifice that was made. Jesus is in this room. The Holy Spirit is wooing you. Don't take on the labels other people have given you. And don't buy into the circumstances that are around you. Don't settle in that gap where it's easy to be disappointed and it's easy to be angry and it's easy to ask questions. She didn't just randomly show up that day and say, oh, well, if I just maybe get to him, maybe something will happen. She went with faith that caused her to crawl on her hands and her knees to get to him. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. That kind of faith doesn't happen in the shallow place. It only comes when you have depth in your faith. I believe that this morning the Lord is calling us to grow our faith in our secret place. Because we can't walk around this earth expecting miracles to happen without starting there. They're happening around us. He doesn't need us to do the miracle. He's doing it. But we may miss it. And there's an invitation for us to be a part of that. We have to remember the source. It only comes from God. The fruit that God produces after he heals can be beautiful and it can be glorifying to God. But it's not on our terms. It's not on our schedule. I wanna close with this thought. Whatever the miracle is that you are seeking this morning, whether it's a physical touch from him, whether it's financial provision, whether it's mental clarity, whether it's for someone else, for the wayward son, wayward daughter, whether it's freedom over addiction, whether it's restoration in your marriage, whether it's just for a new heart and a, and a new mind, I would just encourage you, 
I would implore you to start in your quiet place. The woman had to fight death through the crowd. We don't have to do that. But there are other things you might be pushing through. Fear, disappointment, anger, despair, lies from the enemy, but Holy Spirit is here. And he is wooing you, encouraging you to keep going. Our God is a miracle worker. He still heals. He can and he does. He still provides. He still saves. He still forgives. But right now, because of the sacrifice that was paid by Jesus, we have direct access to him. And so let's just end by closing together. And I know Pastor Alex is coming because I've gone over time. Holy Spirit, we yield to you. The very miracle that we're praying for, we know what it is. It doesn't even cost us a lot of thought because it's right there on the top of our mind. Whether our, our own voices have gotten in the way or voices of those around us have caused doubt, Father, we cast them out in the name of Jesus. And we claim that your voice would be the only voice that we hear. Father, lift the veil over our eyes that we may look with um, eyes that have been opened to expect the supernatural. May we live our lives with expectancy that you are going to bring the breakthrough. It may not be when we thought, it may not look like what we thought it would look like, but we yield to you, Father, because you're our Father and you know us best. For the person in the room today who is just full of doubt, would they hear you speak their name? Father, son, daughter, I am your Father and you are mine. Would they be so aware of your presence and would they trust you completely? completely. Father, we feel you wooing us to have more depth. And we don't want to take that for granted, the time that we have with you to build our trust with you. I want to live a life that is built solely on faith in Jesus. And ask that right now, I know your Holy Spirit is here. There were so many hands that were raised at the beginning of service saying, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. Would we not just say it? Would we not just cry out to you? But would we use the authority that you have given us to claim the healing that you wanna provide? We ask that you would just settle here, make your home here, in this house, in these families that are represented, in these hearts. Would you, we just give you the freedom to move. Thank you, Father, for healing. Thank you for saving. Thank you for doing the miraculous work, Father, that truly brings kingdom here on earth. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Beautiful. Beautiful.